I had taken up trail running to try and get in better shape. I'd been an avid hiker my entire life, but my metabolism dropped like a rock in my mid-twenties, and my leisurely hikes just weren't cutting it anymore. I'm a very goal-oriented person, so I set myself a goal of running at least one mile every day, no matter what. I hadn't missed a day since I started in the spring, and I was feeling better than ever. Even when it was pouring rain, I ran at least a mile. There was a great, little state park about 10 miles away from my house. The trails were well-maintained and well-marked. Some were in the forest, and others were along these rolling prairies. All the trails were color-coded and ranked by difficulty at the trailheads. Spring and summer went great, but we were moving into fall now. I still maintained my goal of running at least one mile per day, but the days were getting shorter and I found myself running in the dark after work on weeknights. I wouldn't say I'm afraid of the woods, but I usually got my mile in and then went home. I would run longer on weekends to make up for it. There were really only two trails that were short enough for my after work runs, the Red Trail and the Purple Trail. The Red Trail goes through dense forests and had some significant inclines, while the Purple Trail was fairly flat and followed along the edge of a very lazy river. My daily goal was a mile. A mile of hills or a flat mile. It didn't matter. A mile was a mile. So more often than not, I ended up on the Purple Trail. The Purple Trail was an out-and-back trail with a small loop at the very end, like a lollipop, an easy mile. I'd never experienced anything strange there before. I was always a bit uneasy after dark, but mostly because I couldn't see other people until I was right next to them. I would take my headphones out so I could hear better. During my daylight runs, I always kept them on. One day I was running along the purple trail and listening to the sounds of a nearby river. The sun was setting, but it hadn't gotten totally dark yet. It would be dark on my way back, but I still had a tiny bit of light left. The first thing I noticed was the smell. There was a sudden, putrid smell that seemed to come out of nowhere. It's hard to describe. It was musty, maybe moldy smelling, kind of like rotting fruit or garbage. It didn't smell like a dead animal or anything like that, but it was pretty unpleasant. I just sort of held my breath and ran past it. I had to do that sometimes when dead fish would wash up along the riverbank the downsides of hiking next to rivers. I left the smell behind as I continued my run. I knew I'd have to go back that way and I hoped it would be gone by the time I returned. I didn't notice anything off or strange the rest of my run, but when I returned to the spot with the smell, it had grown even worse. I could barely get past it without gagging. It smelled like wet garbage right in the middle of the forest. It was dark now, but I stopped to look around for the source of the stench. The light from my headlamp didn't reach very deep into the forest, but it didn't need to. I saw two eyes shine back at me from the trees. It was maybe 30 feet away from me. It caught me off guard, but I figured it must be some animal since, well, I'm in the forest. But then I heard it move. It sounded huge. The tree limb was crackling underneath it. It looked like it was coming down the tree, and I immediately thought it was a bear. I know you're supposed to stand your ground with a black bear, so I started yelling and waving my arms to look bigger. I kept my light pointed at it, and then I saw its fur. It wasn't black. It was gray. It looked wolf-like, but wolves don't climb trees and they don't smell like garbage dumps either. I ran all the way back to the parking lot, got in my car, and locked the doors. I was terrified and out of breath, so I sat in my car for a moment to regain some composure. It was a moment too long, because I started to smell that smell again. I put the car in drive and tore out of the parking lot, but before I got back on the road, I had to turn towards the trailhead. 
My headlights pointed straight down the center of the trail I came from, and I saw the flash of eyes reflected back in my headlights. I didn't stay to get a better look at it. I drove out of there as fast as I could and never went back. I lost my career because of this. For 20 years that career defined me. I haven't recovered. I'm not sure that I ever will. If my career's gone though, I might as well talk about what happened. They don't realize it, but they gave me nothing to lose. I worked in veterinary forensics in a lab based out of the southern United States. My specific responsibility was DNA typing, sequencing, and identification. The lab offered its services to federal, state, and private agencies. I don't imagine that veterinary forensics is a job that most people are familiar with. After one of these agencies would hire us, it would be up to me to identify the exact species or DNA fingerprint of animals involved in criminal acts perpetrated by human beings. If a dogfighting ring had been broken up, I would identify the specific breed of any casualties. If an unidentified carcass was recovered from a trafficking or illegal hunting operation, I would determine what type of animal it once was. The evidence I prepared would be used in court cases that shut these criminal operations down. It was a fulfilling job. I felt like I was doing my part to make the world a better place. A strange request came in one day. It was submitted by a private agency, but came equipped with the same levels of ambiguity and prioritization that federal jobs often carried. This specific agency had recovered a carcass that needed to be identified. We didn't have any information to go off of, so when a sample of the specimen arrived at our lab, I was starting at square one. Physically, the flesh we received seemed to be aquatic in origin. It was pale white and seemed like it had been eroded by salt water. I was worried that the DNA would be compromised. Initial tests revealed no signs of erosion, however, and no traces of foreign water of any kind. I thought then that whatever land animal it belonged to had been without its circulatory system for so long that it had lost whatever pigmentation it normally had. It was a stretch, but the color and texture of the skin were making me scratch my head. We moved on to the various steps involved in DNA identification. What we learned didn't make any sense. The DNA wasn't very far from our own. The order of the nucleotides was rearranged in a few areas, moving it further away from our species or any species of ape. It belonged to something else, we realized. We ran the tests again, and the results didn't make any sense. Trying to understand them while looking back at the pale glob of flesh was making our skin crawl. We got the same results. What we were looking at, we knew was either a grossly mutated sequence of human DNA or something entirely unidentified. Neither option was the responsibility of our facility. We worked in veterinary forensics, and there was a chance that this DNA didn't belong to an animal species at all. More importantly, if the agency who contacted us knew this in the first place, they were willfully keeping this information from the government agencies that should have been involved in the identification of human remains. I contacted our employers personally and told them the results of our tests. They disagreed with me, as if the sequences we had identified could somehow be mistranslated. More alarmingly, they demanded I hand over any genetic material we had in our possession and purge any information that we had gathered from our records. I refused. Instead, I forwarded our findings and photographs of the specimen to as many organizations as I could. There wasn't a forensics lab in the country that didn't receive an email from me that day. I made sure that the FBI was informed as well. You see, I still believed at the time that the independent agency we were working for wasn't affiliated directly with our government. Plenty of conspiracies traveled through my mind, but none of them connected our mysterious employers to the powers that be. That was until the FBI arrived the following day. 
Everything that was asked of me by the private agency was executed instead by the FBI themselves. They took the genetic material, they shoved our paper records into boxes, and they wiped our cloud servers of any data gathered in the last six months. They erased everything. Suddenly it was like we never even worked for the agency in question. It was like we never saw the unidentified lump of flesh and never ran our tests to identify its origins. As far as anyone else was concerned, the lab I worked for hadn't been involved in any forensic studies for six months. I could have lived with that, I think, if it had stopped there. I could have convinced myself that the responsibility had transitioned into more capable hands. I was the one who reached out to the FBI after all. However they wanted to handle the incident was their business and not mine. I would have been happy to return to work. Then, I was fired. Any individual within the company who had come into direct contact with the specimen was let go. One by one, we were plucked out of our profession and dropped into the unknown. Someone worked to silence us even before we considered talking. They weren't willing to take the chance, and through everything they've done, they've succeeded. I work at a grocery store now. I hate it. There isn't a forensics lab in the country that will look at my resume. My profession and my life have been totally erased. If it wasn't for my frustration, I'd have probably given up by now. I'd fall into that zombified state of contentment, scanning item after item, taking it day by day. But I'm mad. I want to know the truth. I want to know what was worth sacrificing my life for. What were those remains? And where did they come from? It's a scary thing being faced with death. We don't like to think about it because we know it'll happen to us and those we love. And it also poses the question of what happens after? I've never believed in ghosts before. I believe that when we died, we just died. There was nothing after. But I guess my views have changed quite a bit since this happened. We'd been dispatched to a restaurant. It was a small Mexican restaurant, family owned. It was actually one of my favorite restaurants to eat at. On Saturday nights, they'd open up the basement so we could play some pool. It was a good time. In fact, many of the officers from my department would go after a late shift. So we were surprised when we were called to the establishment for a possible break-in. It was early in the morning, I'd say 6.30, a.m. We were told that the owners had received a call from one of the cooks who had gone in to prep for the day. They had stumbled upon some broken glass and some of the tables had been knocked over. Much of the place was in disarray. When we arrived, the owners were devastated. They believed that they'd been targeted because of their ethnic background. Being that I'm also Hispanic, I assured them that it didn't appear to be anything of that nature, but that I'd help get to the bottom of it. I could see why they believed they were targeted. Much of their property had been vandalized, but nothing was taken. However, if it was indeed a situation involving race, they would have destroyed things like the sombreros that were hung up along the bar, or even graffitied the large mural of the Virgin of Guadalupe at the front entrance. Nothing related to Hispanic culture had been harmed. Just a lot of broken chairs, upturned furniture, and things of that nature. It was really unusual. The destruction of the restaurant seemed to have been an act of anger. In this way, they did feel targeted. We had asked about the events that had transpired the night before. Had anyone been upset with their visit to the restaurant? Did they recently let someone go who may be disgruntled? Was there a chance that someone had been locked inside the restaurant that night? To all of these questions, they answered no. After that, all that we had to go on were some cue balls that had been left in some glass shards. It was very unusual. My guess was that someone threw the balls at the glass partitions, but I couldn't answer why. So I went down to the pool hall. It was in the basement of the restaurant, as I mentioned. I took the stairs down. When I got down to the basement, I felt inexplicably cold. I know it's a basement at all, but I felt like I was walking into a meat locker. 
The air felt very dense, thick. That's the best way I can describe it. I started looking around for any signs of vandalism. It was surprisingly well kept. Nothing seemed out of place. Even the billiard balls were in their place, with the exception of the couple that had been found upstairs. I started looking under tables and corners for a possible suspect that may have been hiding. Not a trace of anyone. But then I started smelling cigar smoke. It was very strong, like someone had been sitting in the pool hall for hours. And it just came out of nowhere. It made me feel sick, but it was so unusual, I really had no explanation for it. But I continued looking for any evidence that we could use later. It was weird. So in the billiard room, they had a couple of booths on the south side. And opposite that, there was an old bar with some mirrors that were placed along the walls. So when you looked toward the bar counter, you were looking back at yourself. Of course, they didn't use the bar downstairs. I was told that they didn't have enough wait staff to manage the pool hall and the restaurant. So it was literally only used for pool. Anyway, I'm looking around and I keep seeing myself in the mirror, which was really causing me some trouble. I kept thinking I was seeing someone in the room with me, when really I was just seeing myself. It was really tripping me out, but I didn't find anything. So I went to turn back towards the stairs to head up to the restaurant, when I heard a clack. I turned, and I see all the billiard balls just spreading out around the pool table. So I'm like, oh hell no. There wasn't a draft. No one else was down there with me. How did these balls move? So I start looking around again. I'm really feeling like someone's watching me. Like they're in one of the booths and they're just eyeballing me. But again, there's no one there. I'm getting uncomfortable. So I start making my way towards the stairs and I just hear this awful sound. It sounded like glass shattering. So I turn around again, and I noticed that one of the mirrored panels had shattered all over the bar. Of course, everyone upstairs hears it too, so they come running down. I told the owners what happened. They said they've been told of similar experiences, like the smell of cigars and feeling like someone else was in the room with you. One of the owners confessed that in the early years of the restaurant, they had an incident where someone had taken their life in the basement. But I wasn't really sure it answered my questions. Was the vandal a ghost? That sounds ridiculous. What other explanation do I have? I don't have one. Do I believe in ghosts now? Yes, I really do. Nothing ever came of the vandalism. So tell me, what do you think? <laughs>